Okie dokie. So, today will be part two of a two part series on pandas. And today will be kind of fun because we'll be going over a group by, aggregation, pivot tables, and with the knowledge that we will gain from today's lecture, we'll be able to answer a lot of real world pandas, uh, real world data questions using the knowledge that we have in pandas. So basically, today will be like the end of like the really nitty gritty pandas syntax. And starting tomorrow and the week afterward, we're going to be moving into using pandas to do some data related questions like exploratory data analysis and data cleaning. So after today's lecture, the goal is to give you all the building blocks you need to actually do some meaningful and useful data analysis with pandas. So it's quite exciting. Okay. Um, I believe last lecture I kind of alternated between function and method. Uh, for the purposes of this class, I will just use the word method to refer to a function that belongs to a class. So for example, yesterday we saw pd.readcsv. I will say that readcsv is a method on the pandas module or the pandas class. We also saw yesterday that you can use uh, data frame .sort values, And I will also say that sort values is a method of a data frame class. Okay, so just to be consistent, um, really in the real world, you'll hear method and function just used interchangeably. In this class, we'll just use method because that's consistent with 61A and 61B here at Berkeley. OK. Uh, that's supposed to come one at a time, but now you have a wall of text. You can, we can go through them one by one. There'll be a live lecture at Piazza there, which Ishan will post. He's in the back. Everyone say hi, Ishan. Hi, Ishan. Um, so if you, ask, if you have questions that you want to ask on Piazza, you can post there. You can also have the option to post anonymously in case you think your question is really silly or really dumb. Um, or really, or really private in some, in, right, private to you, but not private to the class, you know, because everyone can see that thread. Um, you can go ahead and post it there. Okay, uh, well, our lectures will be in this room until further notice, which essentially means until the screen is fixed. After which we'll probably move back because this this room is a little small for us and there's no AC. Although thankfully it's not too hot. Berkeley does get to like around 80s in like July and August or so. So uh, by that time we'll hopefully be back in Evans. And they will have to set up some fans in Evans, too, because I don't think there's AC in Evans. Um, OK. Exam conflict form due Friday. Small group tutoring, more info soon. Uh, project one for this class will be released today, uh, probably tonight evening. And it'll be due next Tuesday at 11.59 PM. Um, it will be some more pandas manipulation. And essentially, it'll just be like an extended amount of practice for pandas. So you guys can really get that practice in and really come uh, to hopefully feel more confident working with pandas. OK, now, homework one deadline. Um, I know that a lot of you guys had trouble submitting it. And I understand that there were issues with like OKPy OK and like PDF generation. So we extended the deadline to tonight to try to give you guys one more day to work out those issues. Um, very quickly, to try to show you what you should and should not do with homework one, I have here, I'll go through very quickly what I would do if I were you to submit homework one. Okay. So, I will go to the syllabus, I will click homework one, and I have no internet. Thank you, Iberis. Okay, well, let's try this again. Oh my gosh. Does Iberis 2 do this? Uh, okay, if this doesn't work, then I'll just have to walk you through verbally what I would do. Oh, I do have homework one open here. Okay, so let's do that. And of course, this Airbrace window is just blocking all of my screen. Uh, sorry? Yes, yeah, so let's try Cal Visitor. Thank you. You know, we're living in the 21st century, and yet I still can't connect to Wi Fi. Ah. Okay. Hello. Hello. Oh, I see light. Oh, okay. I have light. Excellent. Okay, so as I was saying, go to the website, click homework one. When you open homework one, you do have to run this first cell here. So don't forget to run this, even though it's at the very top. Um, and then what you'll do is you'll fill in your answers as needed. So like for example, here I have uh, 
I have here, well, I have here the answers to the first question on the homework, but hopefully, I does, hopefully by now you have the first question done. Um, so what happens is you'll fill in the code here, run the cell, and then run ok.grade, and you should see something that looks like this, which means that you pass all the test cases. One thing I do want to point out is, um, okay, let me go down to here. So here I've deliberately put in some wrong numbers. Okay, so don't copy these down uh, because these are not the right answers. You will get this question wrong on the actual homework if you write down these numbers. I, do, I want to illustrate the fact that our test cases are not comprehensive, which means I can make these numbers whatever I want, more or less, and OKPy will still say that I pass all the test cases. Okay, so if I change this number to like 13 million, I will still pass the test cases. Okay, and the reason why we do that is because uh, so this test case is actually tests something. It tests that uh, your result looks somewhat right, like it has the right type. So it'll check probably here that, um, that the result of the variable a is a numpy array, and it has the right dimensions. Um, but it will not check the values in uh, the variable a, at least not to you. For us, it will check the actual values and make sure that they're right. Okay? And the reason why we do this is because, uh, not because we just want to ding you points for like, not like, really like, getting the numbers exactly right, but because in the real world, you will not have test cases when you're actually working on your data analysis. So when you're like out, out there working on a data set, um, there will be no OK pi. There will just be you. And you will have to decide whether your code is OK or not. And so um, the point of this challenge in this class is uh, to, to one, make you aware. Well, I do want to make you aware that even though you pass it here, you might not pass it on the actual auto grader. Um, I do want to make you aware that this is the reason why we do this is not to ding you, it's to help you learn and to help you really think about like, okay, I can't trust these test cases by themselves. How would I verify whether my answer is correct or not? And that's something that's pretty realistic to do in, in uh, actually working with data. I had a question to that. Yes, your name yeah. and question? Hans asks, uh, if you pass the test cases locally, will I guarantee partial points? No. Because, as you can see, I just wrote whatever numbers I wanted here. So I could really demonstrate very little knowledge of the problem and still pass the test cases locally sometimes. Other times they may give you partial credit, but I make no guarantees about the partial credit you may or may not get from passing the test locally. <laughs> yes? For lab, all the test cases are displayed, so you don't have to worry about hidden test cases for lab. Yes, good question. Oh, and one thing I did want to do is make my microphone volume louder, because I noticed that the screencasts have pretty low volume. Just turn, oh my gosh, that's so low. Okay, let's try that. I think, maybe a little lower, hello. Okay, hopefully now the screencast will have better volume. Okay, so I want to make you aware of that, okay. Next thing I want you to be aware of is when you're working on these math questions, okay, you'll see here when I click on the cells that different cells highlight, you should not edit the cells with this, okay? So if you click enter and you see this pop up in the cell, you should immediately backtrack, don't change anything, and move on, okay? So the reason why is because we have this little hidden code here that says export to PDF. If you mess around with this code, your question will not appear on the PDF. When you try to convert to a PDF at the end of the assignment, it's going to say something like, uh, like missing number, of, wrong number of questions, did you forget to do a question, or did you delete, did you delete a cell? Okay? So don't do that. Instead, click on the text that says write your answer here replacing this text. Double click on that or press enter, and then replace this text right here with your math. Okay, so if you don't put your math in the right spot, your PDF will not convert properly. Um, hopefully this resolves some of your PDF conversion issues. So to illustrate, I have here an answer to this question, which is clearly uh, not right, so don't copy this either. And I will paste this here. And that's how you should work on your math. So once you're done here, I'll press Shift Enter to run that and display the math. And so I will go through the homework all the way down, so on and so forth. Um, go through the plotting, and at the very end, I have this cell. And what you should see when you run this cell is something that looks like this. So I run the cell, it says generating PDF, the PDF saves, it's submitted to OKPy, and you should see this link. If you see this link down here, you can click it, and you should be able to verify here, okay, this is Wednesday, this is the right date, this is the right time, this is me, and you can scroll down and look through the notebook here. 
Okay, so this means that you've submitted your assignment to the auto grader only, not the written portion. In order to actually finish submitting homework one, you have to go back, okay? So what I do here is I can view header, I can click on Jupyter here, uh, let's command click. What you have to do is you have to go back to Data Hub, okay? Go into SU19, find your homework one, and you'll see this homework one.pdf. <laughs> Once you find a PDF, you click download, and then now you should be able to open this PDF and verify that, for example, that my math appears right here in the PDF. Okay, so if the math doesn't appear, you won't get credit for the you won't get credit for the problem, or you'll at least have to like submit a regrade request, and it'll be a big pain in the butt. Okay, so you do want to make sure you go through that PDF, make sure your questions are there, just go through the whole thing. You know, it's like worth the it's worth the effort to like go through it because it's your actual grade and your actual points. Um, so do make sure you go through it and then make sure that things are there. Once you're done. You will then submit to Gradescope. Okay, so you will log on to Gradescope.com. I cannot show you the student view because I'm an instructor, but you will see something that looks like homework one, and you click on that homework one, and you'll upload the PDF, and that will complete your submission for homework one. So again, um, make sure that you put your math responses in the right cells. Make sure that the last cell of the notebook uh, works properly, and then uh, make sure you submit the PDF to Gradescope Otherwise, uh, your submission won't be complete. OK. Now, I noticed some people yesterday running into some issues with the math generation. Uh, well, I do not have time to debug all your math one by one. For today and for the future, you should know that one good way to debug your PDF generation is to actually, like, so if you're like running this cell and it's just giving you this big old LaTeX error and you don't understand what's going on, what you should do is uh, go back up to your math Try to find the cells that have like the weirdest math and just like copy and paste the math somewhere else for the time being. So for example, if I notice that this cell is kind of acting up weird, I might just cut the cell out, you know, paste it somewhere else, and then try to rerun the PDF generation. And that way at least I can narrow down where the problem is happening. Okay. So if the problem is happening in like cell like three right here, um, then when I cut out the math, it should generate properly. Okay, so that'll at least give you some way to debug the PDF generation issue, um, and hopefully get you get you guys less worried about uh, LaTeX errors or generation errors. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, um, let's move on. Close that. I think we're done here. Okay, uh, announcement for DSP students. I don't have access to your letters because of some like HR system issue. So if you have a letter for and you have like if you have a letter from DSP, please email them to me and your TA so we can make sure you get the necessary accommodations for DSP. All right. I got a question yesterday about indices and indexes, and I just want to be a little clear about the language that we're using in this class. So um, in Python. When you have this code here, and you write like my list bracket three, uh, what we say is that this returns the element at index three, and in Python, all indexes or indices are integers. Now, in Pandas yesterday, we talked about um, how the index of a data frame refers to this column, or not the column, but like the kind of like the collection of labels for each row. So this red box right here is what we call an index in Pandas. And the index contains the labels for each row. So you'll hear, you'll hear me use the terms row labels, or the names for the row, or the index, all interchangeably in this class. And so just to be clear about the way we'll use index, um, as a, again, like using .log extracts values based on their labels, such as models.log California motto. I log extracts values based on positions. Um, but this I look actually looks a lot like Python list indexing. So yesterday I was not very consistent. Uh, I, I probably said something like models.ilook gets the row with index two and the column with index one. And I will not do that anymore because it's just very confusing to people. And so what I will do instead is I will always use index to refer to that red box that you saw in the previous slide, the labels for the row. And I will never use the index when talking, with I, when talking about ILOC. I will instead just say position. So I will say something like 
models that I load to comma one gets the row at position two and the column at position one. I will just not use the word index at all, except to refer to the collection of labels for the rows. Okay. Do, do. Let's talk about group by. So last time we talked, we looked at the baby names data set, and we saw that we could answer some uh, questions about it. We could answer what are the five most popular names in 2017, how many babies are born in California since 1950, how many males are born in California since 1950. So all of these three questions you should be able to answer just using slicing, some Boolean array uh, filtering or slicing, and using like sort values, which is what we talked about yesterday. Okay. There are some harder questions that are also interesting to us as data scientists. For example, like what was the most popular male name during each year in the data? So that means doing something like in 1950, the most popular name was John. In 1951, the most popular name was like Matt. In 1952, the most popular name was Sam, so on and so forth. Okay. The second question says, what are the three states with the most babies born like of all time? And that's possible to answer using what we know uh, currently in this class, but it's a big pain. Okay, so you can actually try to do it. It'll just require a lot of code. And a common theme between those three questions that I showed in the previous slide is that they want to perform some aggregate analysis across some data. So for example, in, that, uh, in this previous slide I had here, the most popular male name during each year in the data. That's essentially saying, OK, for 1955, look at all the male names, look at all the counts, and then pick the male name that has the highest count. And so that means that for each year, each year has a collection of names. And we want to know within each year, uh, I want to I compute some value based on that collection. In this case, the maximum of that collection. <laughs> okay. And so to answer questions like this, we use the, we use the group by operator in Pandas. And when we talk about SQL, um, you may be familiar with the group by operator in SQL, which you should also know from 61A. Um, these two things work the same way, and I'll be going through some examples of why we might use them in this class. OK. So um, what I have here is kind of like a conceptual overview of what group by and aggregate does. So, if we have a series, let's say that each of the ABCs here are different states. So let's say A is California, B is Washington, C is Oregon, all right? And the 314, the numbers on the right side, are let's say like, uh, hmm, uh, like how many, uh, let's see, how many million trees are in each state, for example, okay? And so what we have here is we have like, a, we have here a series, and um, what, we wanted, what we noticed is that the, the states appear multiple times. They have multiple entries. Uh, what we might want to do is find out the total number of trees for each state. And let's say that like, each state appears once for each year. Okay? And so what we do is the group by operator kind of collects all the A's together. It collects all the B's together. It collects all the C's together. Oh, and I have a laser pointer today. Nice. OK, so it collects all the A's together, all the B's together, all the C's together, and the D's together. And then when we aggregate each group, what happens is we apply, in this case, we apply a sum function. We'll apply a sum function to each group. So we'll take the numbers on this collection here and sum them up so we get 6. Take the numbers in this group here, sum them up to get 12. Okay? And so what's happening here is that what we want to do is we have here a list that contains um, we have here a series, sorry, that contains uh, repeated entries with some values for each entry. We use group by to kind of collect the repeated entries together into coherent groups. And then we aggregate the groups together by using an aggregation function that essentially takes multiple values and computes a single value. So you see here we have three values, but afterward we only have one value, okay? So this is a very useful operation. Um, I want to show you this operation like, kind of like in a diagram so you can kind of have this, vis this visual in your head as I'm working through the demos for today. Okay, for a data frame, a data frame can have multiple columns. And so like a series, um, what we do is when we call a group by, we'll collect all the elements together. So if we group by this blue column here, we'll collect the blue elements together, the A's and the B's and the C's. 
but we'll also collect all the columns that come with the grouped column, the grouped column. Okay, so we have here three and AK. This is the first row. We have here one and high. This comes from this row right here, which has um, A for this particular column, so on and so forth. Okay, so we have one group at the top, one group in the middle, one group at the bottom. And in Pandas, when we call dot aggregate, or when we aggregate a group together using uh, aggregation function, that aggregation function applies to every single column uh, independently from each other. So, in the first group, it will call max on three, one, and two, and we'll get back three. We'll call max on one, five, and six, and get back six. Okay. It'll also apply to all additional columns in this data frame. So we have a, k, high, and c, a. Taking the max of a set of strings, we'll get back the string that comes last alphabetically, and so we'll get back high here. Similarly, we'll get back t, x, here. Okay. So um, it'll be a little more clear when I work through some examples, but I did want to show you this diagram so you can kind of get a sense of what's happening. All right, let's go through a demo. Like yesterday, I will be typing a lot um, don't feel don't feel too uh, don't feel too concerned about keeping up, but do try to take notes of what things you think are most important. Also, the demo for today's lecture is right here on Data Hub. So if you click that demo, you should be able to pull up a blank notebook for today's lecture. In that same folder, when you click on that when you click on that link, it should link you to a notebook. And after lecture, I'll change this link so that it'll point to the completed version of the notebook. And that completed version, you'll also get automatically, even if you click the link now, by going to your data hub. So you can kind of look at the blank version, look at the completed version, and try to like, if you don't want spoilers, um, then you can look at the blank one. If you do want spoilers, or you wanted to catch up on something that I, that I went through pretty quickly, you can go and look at the completed one. <laughs> okay. I have here, uh, let's see, open the live version. All right, run some code. OK, and I'm going to try this out today, which is, uh, let's see if I can make this full screen. No. What does this do? Hello, full screen. How come this doesn't go away? Let's do view. OK, well, I guess we have to live with this for today. Don't know why it's not dis disappearing. All right, so I have here a data frame. Let me zoom in a bit. This data frame is the same one that we saw yesterday with the presidential uh, candidates. And what we'll do to this data frame is start grouping it. OK, so we can group a series by another series. If we take data frame and we look at that percent column, we have a series here that contains the, not, like, the percentage of popular votes that each candidate got. Let me actually just delete this so we have more space. OK. And what I can do is I can group by another series in the original data frame. OK, so what am I doing with this code right here? I'm saying something like the following. Let me look at DF again. I'm going to try to get, um, I'm going to try to get the average percent of the popular vote earned by each political party across all the years. Okay, So that means that I want all the Republicans to come together and then take the average of the Republican group. I want all the Democrats to come together and then take the average of the Democrat group. Okay, So the way I make that happen is I write DF and I take the percent column, which is a series, and I group by another series that contains like the groups that I want to form. So in this case, DF party has the parties, and I want to group by this column. When I write df or anything dot group by, what I get is a special object called a pandas group by object. So when you run this code, you won't actually see anything meaningful. It'll just look kind of weird. To actually see what's inside of these groups, we can type dot groups. And we can see here, sorry for the line breaking, but you can see here that there's one group for democratic. And this, uh, this bit of code right here, or this output here says, rows at position 1, 4, 6, 7, and 10, so on and so forth, belong to this first group, which is labeled Democrats. Okay? Similarly, this entry here says, um, for the group independent, I, want, I have rows 2, 9, and 12. Okay? 
So you can see that uh, pants is grouping together. We have like in my image on the previous slide, we have, we're in like the middle column now with, with the three groups. All right. Now, what I can do is take this group by object and I can take the mean. Okay, so in pandas, what you'll always see is something, 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 dot group by, close parentheses, so we'll call dot group by, and then we'll always call, or almost always call, another method afterward. And what this dot mean will do is it'll look at each row, okay, and it will take the average for each group within, uh, with those rows. Okay, so what will happen here is I will get a series containing the average popular votes for each of the political parties in my original data set. So we can see here that Republicans seem to have an edge over Democrats in the popular vote, and independents do uh, pretty poorly overall. Okay. Yes, name and question. Sorry, what was your question? Yes, yes. So is this the same as using an aggregation function? Yes. So what I'm doing here is I'm taking each group's popular votes and I'm taking the average within each group. So I'm aggregating all the votes together and taking the mean of each group. You can contrast this with just taking the mean of the percent column. What would this compute? This will compute just the average popular vote across everybody, across all time, for all political parties. If I want to split off this mean operation by the political parties, that's where I have to use group by. Okay. Let's go through some more examples. So I have here, uh, let me just show you this data frame again. Here's a DF, okay? What I might also want to do, I can show you some more aggregation functions. So I can take the max, for example, and this will get back the maximum popular vote for each political party. We see here that uh, one candidate got 18.9% popular vote, even as an independent. I believe this person was Ross Perot, who uh, I think got a lot of popular votes by running like tons of TV ads. And so he just like had like these 30 minute ads on like NBC or ABC where he would just talk about all these charts and figures and why he'd be great for president. And he got a lot of votes. Okay, we can do dot min. Okay, this gets the minimum. We can do dot size, which computes the number of entries within each group. So we see here that in my data set, there are 10 Democratic candidates, 10 Republican candidates, but only three independent candidates. We can do that first, which gets back the first entry of each group in the original order that it appeared in a data set. Okay, so I'm just showing you some options for aggregation functions. Basically, you replace this guy here with some aggregation function. And that'll get back, that'll like do the group by and aggregation together in one suite. Okay. Now, let's see here. Okay, so I can group by not just one column, I can actually group by multiple columns. All right, so I'm gonna show you my data frame DF again. Now it's pretty meaningful to ask the question, well, for every democratic, for every political party, and uh, for every like, result of winning or losing an election, what were their average popular votes? So in this case, I want to group together both the political party and the result of the election, and I want to take the average of the popular vote across those two grouping operations. To group across two groups, to group using two columns or using two series, I type group by and I pass in a list. This list contains the columns or series I want to group using. So I write df party and then df result. Okay, so this syntax right here, so group by only takes one thing, and that one thing can either be a single series or it can be a list of series. Just like how yesterday we talked about using bracket notation, bracket notation takes in, for example, a single string or a single uh, label for a column, or it takes in a list of labels for columns. Similarly here for group by, we can give it a list of objects to group by. And what happens here is, again, I get this series group by object, and what happens is I can take the mean of this. Okay, now this is getting long. When my lines of code get long in pandas, what I like to do is wrap the whole expression with parentheses. So I highlight the whole expression, 
I do shift open parentheses, which automatically adds parentheses to the beginning and the end of my selection. And within the parentheses, I can put new lines pretty much anywhere that I choose. So in this case, I'm going to put a new line here and a new line here. And now it's pretty clear that I'm doing a group by and then a mean. Okay? And so what happens, what results from this is I have Democrats. I see that when they lost, they had an average of 44.85% of the vote. When they won, they had an average of 49%. Independents have never lost, so they only have an entry for loss. They have, they, when they lost, or they, I guess their total average is 11% of the popular vote. Republicans lost and win, so on and so forth. So we can group by multiple columns. It turns out to be pretty handy. Um, but this output here is a little curious, right? So we have what looks like here, it looks like we have three columns. But in reality, we only have one column. It's a series. It's a one-dimensional collection of data. So for example, if I grab the first element, or the first element of this series, I will get back 44.85 by itself. I will not get back the other two, like what you see as the labels of this series. Okay? And the reason why that happens is because these entries right here are actually the indexes of the series. It turns out that in Pandas you can have uh, a data frame or a series with multiple indexes, and we call that a multi-index. It's quite complicated to learn and to use, um, but you will see it every time that you use group by with multiple columns. So it's good to know like what you're looking at. Uh, yes, question. Name and question. Yes. Um, would there be any uh, time where you would say that it's from another table? Like you would use another table to test DF? Yes, a good question. So Colby asks, um, what, like, would I ever not put DF here? And the question, and the answer is almost never. So um, you'll almost never have to do it, but sometimes you will, and this is the most flexible way to do it. Because you might have a series. Um, well, what, what, what might actually happen is something like this. So if I have. If I have here, let's say like DF, let's say I want to group by the decade, right? The year decade. So what I want to do here is take the year column, round it down to the nearest 10, and then group by that year column. And so to do that, what I would write is something like the following. Group by DF, take the percent column, group by the year column, like round it down to the nearest 10, so I'll do something like mp.round, you know, so on and so forth. So I can modify this series. I can, I can even do something like df.year divided by 10, let's say like integer division. And doing that will let me like kind of do, like kind of like finick around with the grouping before I actually do the grouping. Okay, so if I do this, if I do divided by 10 times 10, that should complete the decade. I would take the mean here. I get the means for every decade. Okay, so, so you don't have to write. So actually, like a shorthand that, he, that you'll see often is they'll just put the label for a column here. So they'll just write parentheses, like string year, which is totally fine. This will work as well. Just kidding. It did not work. It works for data frames, not series. OK, so for series, I'm sorry. You will have to write this. OK, I'll show you the shorthand when we get to data frames. Um, but using, using this uh, syntax here allows you to do some nice things with the grouping series before you actually do the grouping. Good question, Colby. OK. Cool stuff. Um, what do I have next? OK, so let's look at this uh, weird multi-index thing, because you will have to work with this at some point. All right. So if I look at the index of this object here, the series, I see that it's called a multi-index. It has two levels, so you saw like two kind of like columns within that index, and the two levels are uh, party and results. Or sorry, the two names are party and results. Okay, let me put that back. And what I can do is I can do dot loc, but dot loc here behaves weirdly. So I have to type in, for example, if I want the forty nine point zero five, I have to type in dot loc democrat democratic and then win and that will get me back 49.05 if I don't type in the second index here I get back a series with just a result as the index so it's like a multi-level index let me comment this out if I do dot loc it will dot loc then the first index and then dot loc 
down the second index. Okay. Um, let's see here. All right, let's move on to data frame. So this is where uh, the same principles apply, but now we can now we can group by uh, we can group by column and have the aggregation function being applied to multiple columns. Let's see how this looks. If I write group by, and here I'm going to use a shorthand, so I can write df party like so. But for data frames, we can actually omit the df and replace the df with just this, just the label of a column. So I'm writing df uh, dot group by string party. Okay. So I'm going to run this. And as before, we get what's called a data frame group by object, which doesn't appear very meaningful to us. But I can type dot groups. And you see here the same sort of like group entry system, the group entry output that we saw with the series. So we have here uh, democratic. And as before, this entry here says something along the lines of rows at position one, four, six, so on and so forth um, belong to the first group. OK. As with the series, I can aggregate a data frame. So I can do, let's see here, dot mean. OK. And this is my output. I get back the mean of all the other columns for each political party in my data set. So I have democratic, the average uh, popular vote was 46.5, the average year was 1998. You may notice that the original data frame had many more columns than just percent and year. By default in Pandas, the aggregation function applies to all other columns besides the one you're grouping by. So when I group by party, Pandas will try to take the mean of candidates, percent, year, and results. But since the mean function does not really apply to candidate and results, it will drop those automatically without telling you. Okay. So uh, just be aware that Pandas tries to be smart, but sometimes it will outsmart you. OK, so that's what's happening to candidate and results. The mean function does not apply. So the mean function only applies to the candidate, to, to the percent and year columns. That's why I get back percent and year here. Yes, question. Name and question. Reese, Reese um, yes. Is there a way to Luis asks, is there a way to convert the columns that are not numerics and then take the mean? Um, yes. For example, I can do something that looks like uh, I can take the lengths of each candidate, uh, each candidate name. So I can do something that looks this is a little advanced, so don't worry if you don't understand this. Does that work? I can do that and then add it as a column to my data frame and then group by. But I'm not really changing the original candidate names. I'm just adding a new column with numbers. So yes, you can. what you can do is you can add a new column that has numbers and then aggregate across that. But if you try to take the mean of some strings, that doesn't have too much meaning. And so uh, Pandas will just drop it. OK. As before, I can take the max. And the max here actually applies correctly to strings. right? So the max of a set of strings is a string that comes uh, alphabetically last. So this is, this is actually quite confusing if you think about it from like a software engineering standpoint, where if you change out this like function here, you get back like data frames of different shapes and sizes. Um, in data analysis, things don't really like make sense from a software engineering point of view. They make sense from a convenience point of view. And so this right here is uh, convenient for data scientists. OK. I can take the min. And I get this. So for example, we noticed that the max of the Democratic Party candidate was Obama. So it looks like uh, there, were no Democratic, there were no Democratic candidates with last names that came after Obama in the alphabet, interestingly enough. OK. Uh, yes, question? <laughs> Yeah, what a great question. So what you're noticing here is, uh, well, that's odd. I don't think both Obama and Trump won the presidential election in 2016. What's happening here? Can anyone explain why we get this weird, why we might get this kind of confusing result? 
Yes? Uh, you have a Democratic and Republican candidate for both ways. So that's probably OK, yeah, I think you're getting somewhere. Yes, Danny? I think the max works independently for each uh, party. So it's just getting the max uh, for each. So the deck, like, in this data set, 2016 is the uh, highest year for Democrat and for the independent party, I think, is the most impactful. Yeah, that's exactly right. So Danny says um, the max aggregation applies independently to every column, right? So within the candidate column, we're only going to take the max of all the candidates without paying any attention to the year or the percent. Then we look at the percent, we're only going to take the max percentage. We're not going to look at whether the percentage belongs to a particular candidate or not. So the the pairings of candidates to their percents and to their years is completely lost when we use group by. This is true in most grouping operations, even in SQL. Um, and you do have to be aware of this. I can almost guarantee that it will happen to you one day that you'll do group by dot max. You won't pay attention to this table, and you'll conclude that both Obama and Trump ran for president in 2016 and won the election with 110% uh, total of the popular vote. Yeah, maybe that's how Russia did it back in the day. But um, yeah, so do be careful with this group by. OK, cool stuff. Now, like with series, we can group data frames on multiple, uh, multiple columns or multiple series. Here is the data frame again. Actually, let me advance this. Advance. There we go. OK. Now, I can group by both the party and the result. Okay, so this is valid pandas. Just like with series, I can pass in a list of column labels. I can also write df bracket party here and df bracket result like with series. But when I'm working with data frames, I can just use the labels for columns because the columns have labels. I can take the mean. And again, notice that here I'm getting back a data frame as a, as a result. When I group a series, I get back a series as a result. When I group by a data frame, I'll get a data frame as a result. Now, we see here that we have a democratic and result, we have the party and the results, and we have the average for the percent column and the year column for each of these each of these small groups that I have here. As with the series, you'll notice that both columns here, both party and results, are bolded. That indicates that they are indexes for this data frame. We have a multi-level index because they're grouping by multiple columns. And so you do have to be careful with this multi-level index. Um, for example, you will have to write something that looks like this. If I want to get out this 44.85, I have to call .loc, pass in democratic, democratic, and then comma loss, and then comma percent. So the first, so it'll go party as the first entry in .loc, Result the second entry in dot mode, and then it will move on to the column that I want. Okay. So I should get 44.85, and I get an indexing error. Thank you very much. Uh, what's going on here? Maybe I'll have to wrap this in a, maybe it's not happy that this is by themselves. Does that work? That works, but it's very confusing. Uh, let me check my notes here. Hmm. You know, strangely enough, my notes have similar code, but it's not working here. Okay, so don't do this. I tried to do this, it didn't work out. Let's see what happens when I do democratic. What happens when I do loss? I see. And if I do percent here, will it not work? It doesn't work. Okay, so I think right here I have to do dot load twice. Dot look to get out to percent column. Okay, so that's it's kind of a pain. That's kind of how these things work. I will tell you a pro tip when it comes to these multi-level indexes. Um, I usually just don't want to deal with multi-level indexes. So what I do is this: if I see a multi-level index, I always just reset index, just to like not have to deal with the weird like multiple things inside loc and all of that jazz. I will do reset index. This just turns the indexes into just regular old columns in my data frame. And it'll reset the index to go from 0 to like whatever, like zero, the numeric index, the default one. 
And now if I really want the political party as an index, I can do set index party. And now I have here the party. And this, this is just like the standard one index data frame. Um, Multi-level indexes are like, they're, they're, they look kind of nice, but then once you start working with them, they like really get you in all sorts of weird ways. And so I just really personally prefer to just work with single level indexes and not worry about this multi-level thing. So pro tip, um, this is just a personal pro tip for me. If you find out a way to work with multi-level indexes that really works for you, uh, good for you and let me know. Okay, yes, Dan. Yes, you do. Because you can't set the index for, you can only set index using columns, not, in, not like things that are not columns. Yeah. Okay. Let's see here. All right. Uh, hmm. Running low on time, so I will uh, quickly go through pivot tables. Now, uh, pivot tables are, you will see pivot tables quite a bit in uh, real life. You can make pivot tables in Excel. That's what a lot of Excel users like to use. Um, you will also have seen it in data eight, if you've taken data eight. And most people, when they take data eight, they see pivot tables and they get very confused. The way pivot tables work is you should think of them not as a separate special thing by themselves. You should think of them as doing a group by using two columns. Okay, what do I mean by that? I showed you on the last slide here, if you copy this code here, that when I group by party and results and take the mean, I get back a multi-level index with party and results. And a pivot table essentially says, OK, take the second index here and move it up to the top to form the new columns of a table. So it essentially is a group by using two columns and then a quote unquote rotation to move this second index here up to the labels of the table that the results. So what happened, what's going to happen here is when I pivot table, I'm going to see party as an index, and the columns of this data frame will be loss and win. Let me show you what it looks like. Okay, so I have here df.pivot table. Pivot table. Index is, uh, let's say, party. Columns equals results. Values equals percent and ag func equals mp.mean. And you see here that we have party as the index of this pivot table. And that second result index that I had in the previous group by got rotated to the top. So loss and win from the new columns of this data frame here. So pivot tables are the same thing as doing a group by with two columns. Um, but the second index is rotated, rotated, I put that in quotes, up to the top of the table. Okay, so you see that I have the same values. Let me comment this out, or let me, oh my gosh, paste this down here, replace that code. So when I run the group by, you'll see the exact same numbers just presented as a single series. When I run the pivot table, you'll see the same numbers presented in a two dimensional table format. So same numbers, except I'm only choosing the percent column in this case. Okay. So I'm using the values as a percent column, which means that you'll see these percents show up in the pivot table here. So the same numbers. OK. Um, let's go back to my slides and advance. All right. Do, do, do. All right, so we can go through these slides. Oh, what happened here? Uh, we, don't, we went through grouping in series. We went through grouping on data frames. We've gone through aggregation. Um, one thing I forgot to mention is that when we call dot mean on a group by object, what we're really calling underneath the hood is we're calling this generic pandas function dot ag. Okay? So dot ag says um, aggregate my groups together using the function that the user provides. So um, dot mean is an alias for dot ag with np dot mean because we're taking the mean of each group. This means that you can replace np.mean with whatever function you want to perform arbitrary operations on groups. So I can replace np.mean with np.max. That's equivalent to, to doing like dot min parentheses instead of dot mean. 
I can also define my own functions and pass them into that ag. And that will let me do uh, pretty much whatever I want using a group. OK. If I group by multiple columns, I get a multi-index. So we see here that parting result is a multi-index. We've gone through those examples quite a bit by now. OK. Pivot tables are like grouping by two columns and then rotating one of the two columns, as we just saw. And essentially, they work kind of the same as a group by. So we do the grouping, we do the aggregation, and then we pivot. So we take the second index here, rotate it up to the top. Okay, so as a diagram, hopefully it makes things a little more clear. All right. I am going to, let's see here. I'm going to leave filtering for lab, um, but I will show you this diagram. So sometimes we want to filter out groups based on some value within the group. So if I group on the first column here, I might say I only want um, the groups where the sum of the groups is greater than 10. Okay, so if I write uh, group by and then dot filter and then pass in a function here f, this function needs to return a Boolean, a single Boolean, true or false, determining whether the group should stay or not. So in this case, I'm saying keep only the groups where the sum is greater than 10. So what pandas will do is it will say, OK, well, this first group here has a sum of 6, so let's keep it out. The second group here has a sum of 12, so let's keep it in. The, the third group here has a sum of 13, so let's keep it in. The last group here has a sum of 5, so let's take it out. So this lets you filter out groups using some attribute of the group itself. OK. This is kind of a random note that got thrown in with these slides. Um, it, kind of, it, doesn't, it doesn't relate to grouping at all, so do keep that in mind. But it is convenient, so I'm just trying to introduce it to you as a convenience. So uh, yesterday we talked about Boolean array filtering. And we noticed that you can use the pipe operator or the or operator <laughs> to kind of like uh, take the OR of two Boolean series at a time. Now, it often happens to be the case that you might want, like, for example, both Democrats and the Republicans in my original data set. And you can write this expression sheet down here, which takes two Boolean series statements and ORs them together. And this is totally valid. You can do this all the time. Or you can do is in. And is in is essentially like an OR of multiple equalities together. Okay, so it's just a convenience. Um, just to reduce the amount of code that you write. OK. Let us uh, let's take a five minute break. Let's take a five minute break now, and then we'll go to a case study right after it. Uh, if they say that uh, Bishop started as maybe the 24th by so late, 
do I just say that? Should I just say that essentially they're going to work out my ass for the rest of the other weeks? Do I tell them I haven't started? Should I tell them I haven't started and then balance out my ass for the rest of the weeks or what? Because they can say um, pretty clearly that you're not meant to start, so I'm going to be a Yeah, um, I have definitely started like way earlier than like all second speakers. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if they're like super strict about it, but. Um, Talk to Lashana. Have you talked to Lashana about it? Not yet. Should I email her right now? Do you yeah, think I would see me in person. I think it would be probably better to go into her office today because she's in her office from like nine to four. Okay, good. Um, go right down, please. Yeah, so I was just going there and talking to her in person so you can get a quick answer. At eleven. Yeah. Okay, so I'll just come with you. Um. Yes, I won't be going there. Though. I won't be going back to the office. No, I'll just go home then. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, sure. So, all right. Um, so, if you're coming back from the break, please fill out the attendance form to to uh, mark your attending, mark your attendance for today's lecture. You will have to get the names of people on your left and right, and just just for us to verify, like whether or not, like just that's just to provide a level of verification for us, so that if like if like I don't know, someone's just filling out the attendance form right now. That to like make up some names for people on the left and right, and their names will be inconsistent with what other people say. And so, uh, do you fill out that form? Um, if you're in the aisle, for example, you can say like I have an aisle on my left, and then like no one on my right. If you're sitting next to a wall, you can say I have a wall on my left, and that'll also help us do some verification. Once you, ver- once you fill out the attendance form, you should receive an email to your Berkeley email address. And that email should contain a receipt that you submitted that form. So, those ke- so you should keep those receipts around, so don't like delete them. Um, in Gmail, you can archive them instead of deleting them, um, but don't like destroy those emails entirely. Because in the case that you have a discrepancy with your attendance grade, um, you, can get- you can send us the receipts and we'll like, make sure that our records match what you have in your emails. Also, you can know in faith that um, if you're concerned about your attendance grade at any point, you can go back through your emails and you can look at your receipts. And if you have the necessary receipts for each, like necessary form receipts for each week, then you can rest assured that you will get your grade because you can show us those receipts and we'll be like, okay, this looks good to us. Okay. All right, uh, once we fill that out, 
if 81 responses. How many of you guys are still filling out attendance? OK, I'm going to close the form now. So if you're still filling out, speak now or hold your peace. OK, still filling it out. I'll wait. Uh, I'll move on for like one minute and then come back to the form. OK. Let's look back now at Baby Names case study. And let's take a look now at the types of questions we can answer using group by. All right. So um, with our Boolean array slicing and filtering and the things that we talked about yesterday, we can answer the question like, what uh, was the most popular name of all time? Okay. But we will not be able to answer the question like, what were the most popular names, most, of, most popular male and female names for every year in California? Now that we have group by, we can answer these types of questions. OK. Let's take a look at my notebook. Skip that. Do, do. OK. And uh, let's move back here. OK, so as of yesterday, I have like some code here to download the data, some, some code to extract a zip file. Um, one thing you might know about zip files is that they're a compressed version of data. And so here I have some code that kind of compares the data before and after taking the zip file. And the uncompressed versions of the files are five times as large, which is pretty significant if you, if you like actually think about realistic data sizes because that's the difference between, let's say, like one gig and five gigs. So if you have a computer that has like four gigs of RAM, this is the difference between fitting a data set in Pandas and not fitting a data set in Pandas. Okay. So I'm going to read in the data for California. And we have here California. OK, so this is the same data frame that we saw yesterday. And what I want to do now is make this full screen. Make this full screen. Hello. Here we go. OK. And I want to know um, what were the most popular male and female names for each year. OK, so let's do that. We can start by grouping years. So if I group by year, like so, and I take the size, I will get back um, the total number of rows for each year. So this is not the number of babies that were born in each year. This is something else. Does anyone know what that something is? So if I run this code, this is before, this is my data frame, this is after. And I propose to you this is not the number of babies that were born in 1910. It is something else. Any takers? Danny? The number of unique names. The number of unique names, exactly. Because dot size counts up the number of rows within each group. Okay? It does not actually take it does not actually take the count column into consideration. If I wanted to find the actual number of babies born in each year, I would have to take I have to, I have to look at the sum of the count column. Okay, so do be careful with these group buys. Depending on what your data mean, doing size or sum or the max have different meanings and different interpretations. OK, so that side, I have here the number of unique names in each year. I can plot um, these names. I can plot these numbers by calling dot plot. Dot plot on a series makes a line chart. And sadly, it's cut off. Let me zoom out a little bit. OK. So what we see here is that the number of unique names over time has grown quite significantly. People are just coming up with more and more creative names, I guess. OK. So I can now group by multiple columns. Oh, that's not supposed to be here. Hello. Uh, let me change this to a slide, do that, and we're back. OK. So California. If I group by um, both the year and the sex, now I can take the size. And this is the number of unique names for every year and every sex in this baby names data set. OK? Now, I can take, um, let's see here. I can take the most popular names. If I do dot first, what will happen is I will get the first row for every group in my data set. This is not guaranteed to give me the most popular name, 
But I do happen to know that the original data frame California was sorted in descending order for each year. Okay, so what's happening here is that the way the data came in, and you could have done this, I could have sorted it myself if I wanted to, is that within each year, the most popular names come first. Okay, so I have Mary coming first, and then Helen, and all the names that come, all the female names that come after in 1910 are lower in counts than the ones that come first. That's why when I take the group and take the first entry of a group, I preserve this row. Now, why, could not, why couldn't I have taken the max? What would have happened if I took the max, which seems like a natural thing to do, um, what, what would have happened if I tried to take the max instead of taking the first entry of each row? Yeah, name and name. Casey? Casey? Yep, yep, so if I take the max, right? Remember that ma all the aggregation functions apply to each column independently, which means that I will get the highest count, but the name will not be sorted along, the name will not be retained with the count. So I'm gonna get the name, the name that comes first alphabetically in the alphabet, not the name that had the highest count associated with it. I can show you what happens. And you can see here that, our, so the, the last name in the alphabet, I get back like Yvonne, William, Zelma. Just, it's not the names that have the highest counts. It's the names that, have, that come last in the alphabet by taking the max. Okay, so do be very careful with these things. Okay, so here I have first and not answered my question. In 1910, Mary and John were the most popular. In 2017, Emma and Noah were the most popular. All right. Now, I can actually take these names and I can take, I'm grouping by two columns, so I can make a pivot table. I will make a pivot table. And to make a pivot table, I will write pd or california.pivot table. I want my index to be this next column this time. I want my columns to be the year. The value should be the name. And I will aggregate by taking the first value of each name. OK, so this bit of code here is a custom function that I defined that takes the first entry for every series in each group. So this, this code right here essentially performs the same operation as the line of code I wrote above, but it will make a pivot table instead of taking, uh, instead of a multi-column data frame. Okay, comment that out, run this. And I see here now that I have male and female as the index, and, for the, and I have one column for each year, and I have here the most popular names for each year going down across like this. So it's a pretty convenient and succinct way to present your data. Okay. Now, what I can do is I can keep going. Okay, so let me do that. I can take, let's do, uh, let's indent this a little nicer, do that, okay. Okay, I can take the value counts, or I can take the male names, so let's loc m, because m is a value in the index, right? And I can take the value counts, or what I'll do is this, I'll write this and I'll show you what happens, so I have here, the series containing the most popular male names for each year. And now I can take the value counts for that series, like so. And I see here that Michael was the most popular name 39 times in 39 years. Okay? I, can bar, I can plot these in a bar chart by, pass, by calling dot plot kind equals bar h. And this is getting cut off, I'll delete this, zoom out one more time. Okay, so I can make a bar chart and make some quick visualizations of my data by taking a series and calling dot plot on it. Dot plot has uh, several options, and in this case, I used the option for kind to make a bar chart, a horizontal bar chart. That's what bar H stands for. The H stands for horizontal. Okay. I can actually just plot, let's see here, I can make my pivot table again, all right, and let me not take the first name. Let me actually just take 
um, the number of unique names for each sex, okay, by taking len. And like before, I can plot. If I plot this, what pandas will do is, oh my lord, I have to switch these, I have to switch these columns. Let's try that. Okay. Um, so what's happening here is that when I call dot plot on a data frame, right? So here I have a data frame. Let me comment this out to show you. I have a data frame, and when I call dot plot on a data frame, it will plot um, one one line for every column in my data frame. So here I'm plotting the number of unique female names to the number of unique male names. It looks like female names are more creative because there's more of them. Okay. All right. I had here some practice questions, but I'm going to skip those because you can look at the questions yourself, try to solve them, and then look in our notebook afterward to see the answers. So I'm going to skip these guys and go on to my last question for this data set. All right, so it turns out um, that you can actually get some information about the person's, uh, the baby's like birth sex from the last letter of their name. Let's take a look at how we might do that. Okay. That. Let's keep going here. I'm gonna exit out of the slideshow. All right. Let's do that. Hello. Hello. There we go. All right. So we have here just enough time to do this. Let's do this. Okay. Now, what I want to do is say, okay. Given, a given the last letter of a name, would that name be more likely to be male or female? So that's the base question I want to ask. And the way I'll do that is via combining like pretty much everything that we've learned so far when it comes to pandas. I will also introduce to you some nifty thing um, related to string operations. Okay, so I have here my California table. Let me zoom in again. And I can take the name column. I want the last letter of each name. And the way to do that in Pandas is Pandas has a special uh, attribute called stir. Okay? The stir attribute of a series allows me, to call, it allows me to treat the series as a string and perform string operations on it. This means that if I write dot stir and type in stir bracket zero, what will happen is it will treat each name as a string and get the first letter of each string. I will get back M, and then H, and then D, so on and so forth. So let me show you how that looks, like so. OK, I can also do stir.length to get the lengths of each name in my data set. But in this case, I want to get the last letter of each name. So I'm going to type stir negative 1. OK, so pretty convenient when it comes to working with series of strings. You do have to be careful though because this will not work. Okay, you cannot do this. Dot stir is only defined on series of strings. All right, so I have your last letters. I can assign, I can create a new column in my data frame with this series. If I do that, now I have here a data frame containing the last letters of each name, which will allow me to group by that last letter. Let's group, let's do that now. So I have here my CA table. And I can do ca dot group by last and sex. Let's do that to get more space. And I will take the sum. I'm taking the sum in order to get the sum of the counts. So I get the, I get the number of babies born instead of the number of unique names. OK. I have here the counts. and. I can now take out that count column. That didn't work. OK, I have to reset index. Reset index, and now I have that count column. Oops, not loc, count. I can get the counts just like so. But I'll leave it like this um, because what I want to do now is Let's see here. OK. What I want to do now is actually do that. 
and then I want to make sure that I only have the count column afterward. So when I do dot group by, I can add a bracket afterward to select out some columns to group by. In this case, I don't want the sum of the years because that doesn't make any sense. I just want the count column. Okay, so now I have the count column. What I actually want to do here is I want to pivot this table. So I'm going to pivot this table so I can get one column for F and one column for M. Okay, let's do that now. CA.pivot table. Got to move fast. I'm racing against the clock. Okay, values equals count equals sum. I have here the counts for every last letter. And what I can do now is compute the proportion. I can compute the proportion of female for every letter. To do this, I will do, um, let's do last letter. Last letter, is that, okay, to make a new data frame. And then I can do last letter, F plus last letter, M. Take the sum, the totals for every row. And now I can do something that looks like this. OK, so last letter portions equals pd.dataframe. I'm moving fast here. You can look through this code later to try to understand it. But I'm going to make a new data frame where Do that. Last letter F divided by totals, and the same here with the M. Okay. Uh, let's do last steps. Okay, I'll show you that. Okay. Um, what I've done here, and let me move this to a separate cell. Move that here. All right. What I've done here is compute the proportion of sexes for each last letter of the name. Okay, So this means that if the last letter ends in C for a name, there's a 99, like I would say there's 99% chance that this baby was born a male. I can show you this visualization. I'm going to sort values by male, and then plot. And here it comes. Let's hope this works. Make this plot a little big to really rally, to really wow you. Actually, I'll leave it the way it is now. Okay, I'm gonna exit out of here, and I'm gonna make the time. I think I'm gonna make it a big size equals 10, 10. All right. So what do we see here? What do we conclude from this plot? If your last, if the last letter of your first name begins with a K or a B or a P, I would say you're probably a male. The last letter of your last, if your last letter of your first name begins with E, I, or A, I would say you're probably, you were probably born a female. All right, so cool stuff. I'll see you tomorrow.